Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. We will uh, reconvene, uh, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker of the day, who will continue on uh, this day's topic, which is defining and anticipating disaster. Uh, and we have Kathleen Tierney, who joins us from the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, there, uh, Professor Tierney is director uh, of the Natural Hazard Center, as well as professor in the Department of Sociology and the Institute of Behavioral Science. Uh, during her career, she has studied a wide range of disaster events, including earthquakes in the U.S., Japan, and Haiti, major hurricanes such as Hugo, Andrew, and Katrina, various technological disasters, and the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, in New York City. Her published work spans many topics, including, natural, uh, including risk hazard perceptions, disaster warnings, organizational responses to disasters, disaster recovery, social vulnerability to disasters, and the political economy of disasters. She is the senior author of Facing the Unexpected, Emergency Preparedness and Response in the United States, which was published by Joseph Henry Press in 2001, and the co-editor of Emergency Management, Principles and Practice for Local Government, which was published by the International City and County Management Association in 2007. And she is currently completing a book entitled Social Foundations of Risk and Resilience. So it is our great honor to welcome Professor Tierney, who will be speaking on social science research on hazards and disasters, topics, concepts, and resources. Would you please join me in welcoming her? Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm sorry that I have to be here so briefly, but I have to get back to Colorado because my own center is holding its annual workshop starting at the end of this week uh, for over 400 people from around the country and around the world. So we're, we're engaged in quite a bit of planning and rushing around at this moment. Uh, what I want to talk about this morning is, is basically four things. First of all, I'd like to just give a brief overview of social science research on disasters in the United States, how the field got started, what kinds of issues it was looking at, um, and so forth. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about concepts that you've already been introduced to in Mark's talk, the concept of vulnerability, and also the concept of disaster resilience, which has become a very important uh, concept, not only in disaster research in the US, um, and around the world, but also in policy discourses. Um, talk a little bit about different social science disciplines and the kinds of things that are studied, and then end up by talking with you about some important centers in the United States that deal with the social dimensions of disasters and also resources that are available to you that can help you, hopefully, with your teaching. So. Um, we usually date social science research on disasters in the United States with Samuel Henry Prince's dissertation at Columbia University, which was published in 1922 and dealt with the Halifax explosion in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where a large ship carrying arms and armaments and ammunition blew up in the harbor of Halifax and caused many casualties, um, many, many people killed, and many injuries. But really, organized social science research on disasters didn't start until the late 1940s in the United States and was largely driven by Cold War issues, specifically when the United States found out that the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. It suddenly became um, of interest to governmental and military um, entities to find out about how the public would respond in the event of a nuclear war. We were actually planning for the possibility of nuclear war, so there were questions about how the public would respond. Now, it's ironic that, that such an interest uh, about the public should be raised at that time because there was in fact, and you probably know, a good deal of research done during the Second World War on how the public responded to 
things like fire bombings, um, the London Blitz, etc. And there were surveys done at that time, but um, there was a renewed interest in public reactions uh, during the Cold War period. And some of the things that, you know, the military wanted to know were answers to questions like, would the public panic if there was a nuclear attack or the threat of an attack? Um, would the public be able to help reconstitute society in the aftermath of a nuclear exchange? Or would people be so stunned, shocked, demoralized, and mentally traumatized that they would be helpless in the face of nuclear war? Um, would communities remain cohesive? Would there be a loss of public morale in the event of a nuclear war? Would there be lawlessness and mayhem? Would there be, in other words, an absence of social control leading to antisocial behavior? So these were some of the kinds of things that the military wanted to know, and they turned to social scientists to try to help answer those questions. And it was thought at that time that a lot could be learned about nuclear war responses by looking at how the public responded in the event of, of disasters of various kinds. What was the social situation immediately after disaster impact? Now, we can argue about whether disasters are a good analogy for nuclear war. I don't tend to think so. But that was the thinking of the military at the time. And so entities like the um, Office of Naval Research um, approached academicians, academic social scientists, and asked them, if they would be willing to engage in this kind of research. So the earliest social science research on public responses to disasters um, looked at the general public and to some extent at what we would now call first response organizations, fire police, civil defense organizations, and their behavior and reactions around the immediate post-impact period of disasters. And um, quick response research was done. There were teams that were set up at different universities that would go out immediately after disasters and observe, do informal interviewing, and collect various kinds of information. And at that time, there was no distinction made between so-called natural and so-called technological disasters. They were interested in all kinds of disasters, explosions, hurricanes, tornadoes, plane crashes, and the like. And actually, one of the organizations that was um, a leader in terms of these early first response studies was the National Opinion Research Center here at the University of Chicago. And Henry, Enrico Quarantelli, known as Henry, was a graduate student at the University of Chicago at that time and participated in some of the early field studies on disasters. His particular area of interest was panic and uh, the nature and consequences of panic and the conditions leading up to panic. And Quarantelli went on to be one of the co-founders of the Disaster Research Center, which was established in 1963 at Ohio State University and moved to the University of Delaware in 1985, um, where, it, uh, where it still remains today, doing research on, um, on all aspects of disasters. Um, the, Early research on disasters came up with a lot of what I call good news. It, it brought a good news message about the public and communities in disasters, and it dispelled a lot of the myths that were often uh, believed about disaster responses. 
and address some of the issues that the military sponsors of the research uh, were worried about. First of all, uh, the early research established that panic is extremely rare in disaster situations and even under conditions of extreme threat and um, identified the conditions that do lead to panic when it does occur. And we see this finding played out again and again that, and most recently on Saturday in San Francisco in the plane crash, that even under conditions of severe peril, people can behave in very um, appropriate ways, very functional ways, that they help one another, that social bonds don't break down in disasters. Um, it also established that looting, which a lot of people still believe takes place on a widespread basis in disasters, is actually relatively rare in all but a few disaster situations and there's also an understanding of the conditions that lead to looting. But looting is not a major problem in disasters, um, even now. And despite the fact that the media are always reporting on it, um, it is uh, not what the majority of people do in disaster situations. The early research also established the prevalence of altruistic behavior pro-social behavior, the way that people help one another, um, even if they're strangers. And going along with that, um, one of the early patterns that was seen was a pattern of convergence into disaster areas, not panic and people running out, but convergence into disaster areas as people come to help disaster victims and carry out aspects of the disaster response. And really, this helped to establish the importance of citizen involvement in disaster-related activities. We're always hearing about the first responders and the emergency workers and the people in uniform and the search and rescue teams that come into disaster areas. But the real first responders in disasters, it was established very early on and continues to be established are the people who are in the immediate vicinity of the disaster occurrence. This is who does most of the searching, most of the rescuing, most of the initial response. So the public, it, was, it has been long established, has a very important role to play in disasters. Um, there were things that were not looked at by the early researchers. And early research on disaster responses in the US tended to promote that idea that Mark was just talking about, the idea that a disaster is an event that's concentrated in time and space. Um, and most of what was looked at in these early studies were the conditions immediately before, during, and after disaster impact as if the disaster was somehow an event that was almost divorced from its social context. Disaster arose out of the natural system and impinged upon the social system. That was the way that disasters were thought of for a long time in American disaster research. But then later, um, sort of the framework changed and the paradigm changed. And there was much more of an influence on what Mark was referring to earlier as disaster, not as an event, but as a process, as the consequence of long-term historical, political, economic patterns and particularly looking at the contribution of social inequality, um, social diversity as very important factors shaping the, inf the experiences of people in disasters.
uh, their, their short and long-term recovery outcomes, and their vulnerability, which I'm going to be talking about quite a bit next. Um, a lot of this new thinking about disasters and social inequality came out of U.S. research on disasters that affected large urban areas with very diverse populations. For example, um, the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which struck the San Francisco Bay Area, um, Hurricane Andrew, the Northridge earthquake, which struck the greater Los Angeles area in 1994, and of course, Hurricane Katrina. And Katrina really, really um, initiated an explosion of interest in social vulnerability to disasters and really gave a lot of impetus to the developing field of vulnerability science what goes on and what contributes to vulnerability in disasters. And I'm going to talk next a little bit about the vulnerability approach to disasters and some of the things that vulnerability research emphasizes. Here again, you know, going, going along with what Mark was just talking about, in contrast with sort of the event-based approach to disasters, the vulnerability approach to disasters sees that natural event, that earthquake, that hurricane, that flood, not as the cause of the disaster, but the trigger that brings about impacts and losses taking into account that risk has built up over time. So the risk is there, the vulnerability is there, and the disaster itself represents the trigger that sets in motion or that instantiates these previous vulnerabilities. And again, there is an emphasis on social inequality. Now we can talk about global inequality, the inequality of um, nations within the world system, the global north, the global south, the core and the periphery. We can talk about societal and community inequities as well if we're looking within individual societies like the United States. And um, in looking at Looking at vulnerability, vulnerability science um, takes into account three sets of factors. Um, there is, first of all, the sheer vulnerability of place, right? That, um, that, you know, you have earthquakes in California, and as far as we know, you're never going to have an earthquake in Florida or South Dakota. Right, because there simply isn't that place-based vulnerability. So the vulnerability of coastal areas, the vulnerability of communities that are um, near rivers and streams and in floodplains, so there's that. Um, but there are also ecological and environmental factors that come into play that I'll talk about. Um, there is the vulnerability of the built environment our buildings, our infrastructure, and the social and population vulnerability. Um, so, you know, we do a lot to our environment that increases our vulnerability to those triggering events. When we do things like um, contribute to the loss of barrier islands that could be providing protection against hurricanes and coastal storms, when we do things to deplete wetlands, um, which was definitely seen as a factor in the damage that was done in Hurricane Katrina, the wetland loss, when we do damage or we remove forests like the mangrove forests, that serve as protections against 
tropical cyclones and tsunamis. Um, when we do things to the environment that lessen the capacity of those environmental services to protect us from disasters, we're contributing to vulnerability. And there are also processes going on, climate change, sea level rise, subsidence along coastal areas that we're contributing to um, that, that also make our communities more vulnerable to disasters. One of the things that's going on in, in, you know, around where I live that's related to climate change is that our forests are getting sick. They're being attacked by pine bark beetles. And those pine bark beetles, owing to climate change, get to have one or more additional reproductive cycles every year. So they are having more and more little pine bark beetles. Those beetles are attacking um, our pine trees and making them more vulnerable to wildfire. So in many places in Colorado, the pine forests are not green. They're orange or brown because they've been attacked by these beetles. Also, um, in terms of wildfire, you probably know that our policies related to forest management, um, not allowing fires to burn, but instead always, always, you know, trying to put the fires out, has contributed to a lot more growth of fuels that then under the right, or we would say the wrong conditions, um, incinerate, right? They, they begin to burn up. Also, the way that we're settling the wildland urban interface, also known as the WUI, um, by putting development in that wildland urban interface, we are, um, we are putting in additional ignition sources and additional fuel sources. So, so yes, fire is a natural phenomenon, but there are anthropomorphic causes to wildfires that are causing them to increase, becoming increasingly damaging and increasingly costly to fight. So, so these, these are some environmental sources of vulnerability. Then we also have to look at how we build and where we build, look at the vulnerabilities in the built environment. Um, Earthquake engineers are always fond of saying that earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people. So it matters where we build, it matters how we build. Um, the levees that were supposedly protecting New Orleans were part of the built environment, right? But thanks to the mismanagement of the levee systems, and also thanks to building levees that allow people to develop behind levees, so that when a bigger flood comes along, they'll be flooded. Um, you know, we, we saw damage like this. And it was the failure of that built environment system that led to the vast majority of the deaths in Katrina. Um, the way that we build our apartment buildings, um, the way that we allow in our communities dangerous buildings to continue to exist and to continue to be occupied. These are some built environment factors that contribute to vulnerability. Um, here we see um, this terrible situation in Haiti in 2010 where a, a minuscule proportion of the buildings were built to any kind of seismic resistance standards where you had overcrowded housing, substandard housing in vulnerable areas like on hillsides, um, and where buildings collapsed and trapped people. So it was the vulnerability of the built environment in Haiti that was a major contributor to the loss of life. And uh, California was just mentioned in the previous talk, and you can contrast built environment issues in the 1994 earth, earthquake, uh, the Northridge earthquake, 
in greater Los Angeles where a total of 33 people were killed with what happened in Kobe, Japan, exactly one year later to the day, January 15, 1995, um, the Northridge earthquake and the Kobe earthquake were pretty similar in Richter magnitude. Um, they, the ground shaking that was created by the Kobe earthquake was a little more serious than what we saw in Northridge. Both of those earthquakes occurred at almost exactly the same time of day, about 5 o'clock in the morning or a little after 5. 33 people dead in Northridge, 5,000 people dead in Kobe. Differences in the vulnerability of the built environment to earthquakes. And again, we're looking at two advanced, developed countries um, affluent countries where there was good understanding of earthquake resistant design and construction but a more vulnerable built environment in Kobe. So the built environment matters. Uh, finally we get to social vulnerability and population vulnerability and here as Mark suggested we're fundamentally concerned with who within a community or a society has access to safe places to live, safe locations, safe buildings. Um, people who live in mobile homes, for example, are about 45 times more likely to die in tornadoes than people who live in other kinds of dwellings. And, who lives in mobile homes? Usually less well-off people, right? So who has access to safe places to live? Who has the resource to take long-term mitigation measures uh, to prepare for disasters? Who has the ability to undertake self-protective measures when hurricanes are threatening to make a landfall? people are told to evacuate, right? Who has a car? Who has the money for gas? Who is able to stay if they don't, can't stay with friends in a hotel? Who has the ability to take off work and still get paid when they're taking off work? Um, so, so there is, in other words, a socially structured capacity and incapacity to do the things that you're supposed to do to protect yourself from disaster. When a disaster strikes, who suffers disproportionate losses? And who is more resilient and better able to recover? Who has that recovery capacity? Do you have insurance? Do you have savings? Do you have the ability to get a bank loan? Do you have friends that can help you out? All of these things are important and they're again socially structured, right? So some of the things that we look at in terms of assessing social vulnerability are things like income and educational levels, race, ethnicity, gender, settlement patterns, who is living in dangerous areas, age and disability, um, and social capital. Later there, lately there has been a lot of work on the importance of social capital, that is your networked capacities, your networked connections in your ability to both protect yourself against disasters, prepare and recover. So a couple of the readings that I suggested here for um, the Institute have to do with social vulnerability, social inequality, and vulnerability to disasters. The way that inequality and diversity play out in disaster situations. Um, 
after after Hurricane Sandy, um, I was on that online show called Huff Post Live, which is um, sponsored by Huffington Post, and it was called Hables a Storm. That was the name of the show, and it was about non-English speakers in disaster situations, and they were kind of making fun of Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of Chicago, who I guess his nickname is El Bloombito, because he tries to go on television and speak to people in Spanish. And uh, one of the other people on the show pointed out that while uh, Bloomberg had someone doing American Sign Language during his whole presentation, on what people should do to protect themselves from Sandy. And he talked a long time in English. He talked for about 30 seconds in Spanish, right? So there's a real issue of immigrant populations, non-English speakers, and their access to important information about preparing for, responding to, and recovering from disasters. And in a diverse society like ours, these these differences, and in an unequal society like ours, these differences are very important in terms of how they structure social vulnerability to disasters. Um, we saw it certainly in Katrina, these terrible, terrible images of people who were stranded in New Orleans. We certainly saw it in Haiti, um, informal settlements on hillsides that were vulnerable to landslides during that earthquake, right? Poor people living in substandard dwellings, living in hazardous locations like creek beds where they're subject to floods. We see vulnerability repeatedly being demonstrated in Haiti, whether it's in the 2010 um, earthquake in hurricanes and tropical cyclones, most recently in Sandy, when more people died in Haiti than in any place in the Caribbean, and about as many people died in Haiti and Sandy as died in the United States, okay, a country of nine million people. Um, there is a research center at the University of South Carolina called the Hazards and Vulnerability Research Institute that does a lot of work on social vulnerability and has developed some important online resources. One of them is called SOVI, the Social Vulnerability Index, which uses a variety of social indicators, um, material from the US Census, from the American Community Study, and from other data sources to actually rate the social vulnerability of every county in the United States. And you can, you can, they, they have a variety of mapping products there where you can, you can go in and use the social vulnerability index to look at, look at where are the most socially vulnerable locations in the United States. They also have um, another database called Sheldus the Spatial Economic Loss um, database for the United States, which shows on a county by county basis um, where the big disaster losses have been over time. One of the products that they developed that got a lot of, um, a lot of downloads was the so-called death map, which was published in a journal um, a few years ago where they looked at the spatial distribution, the geographic distribution of deaths from disasters around the United States. And one of the things that they showed is that two very large contributors to mortality in disasters in the US are extreme heat and extreme cold. Any questions so far before I go on? They based the social vulnerability index. They started out with 42 different factors. Naturally, um, 
Uh, they've also been developing indicators of resilience, which I'll talk about next. They look at income. They look at poverty. They look at um, uh, race and ethnicity. They look at female-headed households. They look at age. Um, they take into account some built environment factors as well. And they've, they've, they've used advanced stati statistical techniques um, to reduce those 42 factors to something like 11 different factors, prevalence of owning homes versus renting, all of these kinds of things, and have validated those against disaster losses. So, you can go in and you can find out the social vulnerability score of Cook County or any county, um, find out where the most socially vulnerable communities are in the country. It would make some nice exercises, I think, for students um, who would be interested in knowing more about social vulnerability. Now, I understand that you're going to be getting copies of the slide presentation, so this information should, will be available to you, and you can use it to hunt for things. Um, lately, there is a tremendous amount of talk um, in policy circles and also in research circles about the concept of disaster vulnerability, this is uh, disaster resilience. This is a concept that has really come into currency in the last 10 years. Um, the United Nations has embraced the concept, and it's part of the Hyogo Framework for Action, which is the United Nations Strategy for Disaster Loss Reduction, named after Hyogo Prefecture in Japan, where this agreement was signed in 2005. Uh, Hyogo Prefecture is where the Kobe earthquake happened. Um, and resilient societies and resilient communities are a priority in the HFA and also a big priority in documents like the National Security Strategy of the United States um, and lots and lots of different um, um, policy initiatives and publications. And resilience, you know, resilience thinking, you can see it in ecology, you can see it in psychology, you can see it in social psychology environmental studies, organizational studies. So resilience is, if you will, kind of a transdisciplinary concept that has now been brought into um, the disaster field. And here are some um, definitions of resilience um, and disaster resilience. Here, again, we're talking about capacities as Mark mentioned the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize, the ability of communities to withstand shocks to their social infrastructure, um, a process linking adaptive capacities to a positive trajectory of functioning after a disturbance, the ability of social units to mitigate hazards, contain the effects of disasters, recover, in ways that minimize social disruption, um, the ability to survive and cope with disaster with minimum impact and damage, um, the ability to prepare and plan for, observe, recover from, or more successfully adapt to actual or, or potential adverse events. So there's considerable amount of emphasis being placed now in social science disaster research on what is resilience, how do we recognize it, how do we measure it, and how do we improve it. And the, again, the folks at the Hazards and Vulnerability Research Institute have developed a tool that they call BRIC, B-R-I-C, Baseline Resilience Indicators for Communities that attempt to, attempt to capture what it is that makes a community resilient. Any questions so far? Reactions? Yes. <laughs> 
Well, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the debates in resilience definition. Um, is resilience only the bouncing back? Or does resilience also involve the ability to resist or to withstand? And I think commonly, the common conception includes both that buffering effect and that bouncing back effect of resilience. So um, just like in psychology, uh, particularly looking at children, there's been a lot of research on why children that go through all these horrible experiences during childhood are somehow resilient, right? They're, they don't develop mental illness, they don't develop dysfunctional behaviors. So what are those properties? You know, similarly, what are the properties that contribute to community resilience? Okay, is it a disaster resistant built environment? Is it a good network of community based organizations? Um, what is it exactly, what combination of things allows for that bouncing back and even improvement, as you said, being more adaptable? You know, there's a little town in Kansas called Green, Greensburg, Kansas, that got absolutely wiped out by a tornado. Went right through the town, wiped the town out. What did the town do? They said, we're going to recover and we're going to be the greenest and most sustainable town in the whole United States. We're going to go for sustainability. You know, they have a lead certified tractor dealership. You know, they really, really said, oh, we're going to come back even better. We're going to be a model city. Um, I think a real example of resilience, and Bob Dixon, the mayor of Greensburg, is a really inspirational speaker when he talks about how they decided to come back. Um, as you might expect, there are a number of different social science disciplines that um, have an interest in disasters, and this is only a partial list of them. I put sociology and geography up there first because these were really the two fields that began studying disasters at first. As I said, the Disaster Research Center um, actually started in 1963, um, and many of the early dis disaster researchers were sociologists. Uh, in geography, Gilbert White, another University of Chicago connection because he was the chair of the geography department here before he was stolen away by my university, the University of Chicago. He established my center, the Natural Hazard Center, in 1976 um, and is known as an icon of disaster research, especially in the flood area. Um, one of the um, guiding forces behind the National Flood Insurance Program and floodplain management in general. Um, economists are interested in the economic impacts of disasters, um, in the impacts of disasters on businesses, political science and public policy, obviously concerned with the politics surrounding disasters and the policies that develop to deal with disasters do they work? Um, what contributes to their adoption? Um, what contributes to their implementation? What happens when they are implemented? Anthropology, we've already heard from this morning. Obviously, psychology and social psychology, looking at the psychosocial dimensions of disasters, the short and long-term mental health impacts of disasters. Again, who is resilient? in the face of disasters psychologically, what enables people to bounce back? Is it social support? Is it material resources? What are some of the protective factors there? Um, what is the role of psychological attributes and beliefs like fatalism in people's willingness to prepare for disasters? Um, what about religiosity? If you think 
if you think when it's your time to go, God's going to take you, or God is going to take care of you, what impact does that have on your willingness to prepare? Um, and certainly the social science scientists that work in the public health arena are interested in things like disaster-related mortality and morbidity, uh, the response of public health systems to disasters, the response of the medical sector to disasters. So there is a, there are a wide variety of interests and topics. There are historians that are involved. There are urban planners that are involved looking at what we can do with land use, for example, in reducing the effects of disasters. What is the impact of land use policy and legislation on disaster losses? These are some of the questions that urban planners are interested in. So there's a wide variety of ways that you can approach disaster from the different social science disciplines. Finally, I want to talk about some centers. And uh, this is only a very short list of the centers in the United States that are devoted to disasters. And I put my center up first nat naturally. Um, because our center, in addition to doing research on disasters, serves as a clearinghouse for social science information on hazards and disasters. That's what our funding is for from the National Science Foundation. And this is why the Natural Hazards Center was originally established, was to serve as a knowledge transfer um, center. And I'm going to try to get on the internet so that you can see our awesome um, website, and I'll tell you about some of the things that we do. So, so for example, um, we have a publication series. This is about our annual workshop that I told you about, which we're getting ready to have in um, just a few days. So, this is just a a little screenshot of our um, of the program for our workshop, which starts on Saturday, um, and we have lots of activities at at our annual workshop. People come from um, educational institutions, colleges, and universities. We have a lot of students. We have a lot of practitioners. We have international visitors. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get back to this, though. Maybe we should skip it and go back to the PowerPoint, and I'll just tell people. Because we want to have time for questions. Okay. Okay. So, um, we, are, we have a library with about 33,000 items in it dealing with um, disasters. We're in the process of digitizing our library. We have many of our library holdings that are available in digital form for people around the world. We sponsor quick response research after disasters, and we publish reports from the quick response research. We, um, we have a newsletter called the Natural Hazards Observer, which is available online six times a year, which provides up-to-date information on research, on policy, things that are going on. We're on Twitter. We have a bi-weekly newsletter called DR, Disaster Research News You Can Use. You can subscribe to these or you can pull down um, off the web any of our back newsletters. So this, we serve as an information source on our website, we have tons and tons of links to, to you know, centers in different countries, centers that specialize in different types of disasters or hazards. Um, the Disaster Research Center um, at the University of, of Delaware um, is the oldest social science center in the United States and, again, has a great website, tons of publications, that are available from there. We already talked about the Hazards and Vulnerability Research Institute at the University of South Carolina, 
um, the Risk Management and Decision Processes Center at the Wharton School is another very prominent center. They deal primarily with the economic dimensions of disasters, hazards, and climate change as well as with issues around insurance, asking questions about whether our insurance programs are working for floods, for example. Um, for people that are interested in um, public health issues, there's the Center for Public Health and Disasters at UCLA. Uh, the Center for Public Health and Disasters not only does research, but it also does training. It is a um, public health preparedness center and the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia um, focuses a lot on children's, the impact of disasters on children and children's issues. They do survey research after major disasters and um, that might be another important source. Now these are only a few of the many centers um, that I didn't mention the Hazard Reduction and Recovery Center at Texas A&M as the name would suggest they're fundamentally interested in long-term disaster mitigation and also in disaster recovery. Again, tons of publications and materials that are available for download on a whole variety of topics. And I also wanted to mention that, um, oh, I think about 15 years ago, the Federal Emergency Management Agency established what it calls the Higher Education Project. And the idea of the Higher Education Project is to assist university, college, and community college instructors in developing courses and curricula around disasters. But, but the materials from the Higher Education Project are very suitable for high school, they're very suitable for middle school, um, and you can download textbooks, you can download um, lectures, uh, you can download readings, um, they have a list of you know, the most important publications on disaster research, and they have an annual conference. They have a conference every June because of sequestration. They couldn't have it this year. But um, for specifically for educators to come and talk about what they're doing in their courses, what resources are available. So, you know, I highly recommend the higher education process. And CRC Press, which is a division of Taylor and Francis, is actually publishing textbooks. Um, for example, uh, one of the readings that I had you read, um, identifying and addressing social vulnerabilities, that comes from one of the textbooks. There's a whole textbook just on social vulnerability. There are textbooks on recovery, you know, the spatial dimensions of disasters. Um, they really started publishing these to support all the courses that are growing up around the country around disaster issues. So I, I, I want to thank you uh, for listening to this presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. And once again, I'll be circulating with the microphone, and we do ask that you use the microphone to ask your question so that we can have it on our audio track of the recording. And also, if people could begin introducing themselves, it might be a nice way for us to begin to meet one another. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Barbara Willard. I live in the community. I'm a retired nurse. And I'm very interested in the topic and very excited by the reading by Mike Davis, which opened my mind to all sorts of ways of viewing the world that we've gotten ourselves into. So I'm starting to think ahead about, well, now what? And it seems, from what you're saying, I believe that you think that education is perhaps the most important thing. So I'm thinking on the heels of your mentioning the sequestering. I was a federal employee 
and we had many, many hours of continuing education, mandated, compulsory. And I'm thinking for starters, I would like to propose that we mobilize and have required mandatory education a la Mike Davis for our politicians. Government-wide, do they all know the history of how decisions made over time and how they interface one another is so complicated, but I would love to see more required education and certainly at the elementary and the high school and the college level and as you are doing with so many people. But what say we get politicians in on this and mandate <laughs> that they have <laughs> education? Well, um, there, there is in Congress, there is a Natural Disasters Caucus and that might be a good place to start and there are some members of Congress and senators that are really interested in disasters like um, Ron Wyden, for example, from Oregon. Um, but it's a tough sell. It's a tough sell. Other questions? I think this feeds into your question from earlier, but um, the uncertainty or the certainty principle you know, how certain do we have to be? There, there must be people doing research into how certain do we have to be in order to spend a million dollars? Well, how about a billion dollars? How certain do we have to be? How, how, where is the studies with that now today well, going? Well, um, there are a number of people in the, field, in the fields of economics and decision science that spend a lot of time thinking about uncertainty. Um, and there is a lot of research out there that tells, that could tell policymakers about probabilities. For example, there's extensive research in California on the earthquake threat, the probability in the next 30 years, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, however, um, there is this little. Uh, thing that's also been identified by decision scientists called the Nimtoff syndrome, not in my term of office, right? And one of the problems is that, of course, all political decision makers hope that something won't happen on their watch, right? So their time horizons are very different, okay? And their priorities are very different. Um, the other thing about certainty and uncertainty, um, you know, we have a pretty good handle on many probabilities and many uncertainties. But um, it isn't, we find, uh, probabilities or certainties that drive the policy process. Okay? When um, a decision was made to go to war in Iraq, nobody sat around and talked about probabilities or how much money they would spend, right? So it is a matter more of political will than of information deficit. Lots of people argue on the information deficit theory. If only they knew, right? If only they knew, if only we could give them the right information, they would make the right decisions, right? It's not true. Oh, not to mention, of course, that we have an active climate change denial industry that's working to create uncertainty where there is not. Um, I'm wondering, I guess, on like a very micro level of um, like having a lot of teachers in the room, if there are things that we can do, like even as small as like when we do a fire drill, um, like things that can have students be thinking more in like a, a thoughtful way about those kind of things or if there's any research about like the very micro um, level communities such as schools um, and about what we can do in education there. there. There is research on school disaster preparedness. Some of it has been done at the UCLA Center for Public Health and Disasters. Um, there are curricula um, that exist. Um, there is an earthquake research center at um, SUNY Buffalo 
MCER, M-C-E-E-R, used to be called the Multidisciplinary Center for Earthquake Engineering Research. They have developed K-12 curricula um, on earthquakes. Um, earthquakes are in the science curriculum uh, in California. Um, getting things into the curriculum is difficult, isn't it? Yeah. I have one question that I would like to ask, and it's related to this concept of resilience, uh, which struck me as really intriguing because it seems to be rooted in a proactive vein of thinking. So unlike vulnerabilities, which seems to be about diagnosing problems, resilience speaks to identifying strengths, solutions, so on and so forth. And I was curious, as resilience has gained salience or traction in the academy, whether it's changed the type of interventions uh, that have been directed towards either preventing or responding to potential or actual disasters? Yeah, there are actually some um, initiatives going on. For example, the Red Cross um, recently established a position of vice president of the National Red Cross for Preparedness and Resilience. And the Red Cross is actually doing some pilot studies in communities to, with the aim of enhancing resilience. There's another organization called the Community and Regional Resilience Institute, CARI, which again has great sources online, a number of white papers on resilience. They are also working out there in communities with the idea of enhancing resilience in, as you said, a proactive way, right? Um, how do we increase inherent resilience or resistance? How do we increase adaptive resilience, the ability to bounce back, cope, adapt? There's a, a tool called CART, uh, the Community Assessment of Resilience Tool, which is meant for use with communities where they can assess their own resilience. Nice projects to actually go out to neighborhoods maybe and look at, have them assess their disaster resilience. Another question? Uh, I'm Mike Beslow. I was wondering, uh, and this is for any of the presenters or the future presenters, I don't know if anybody's going to cover this or not, but uh, you know, Doctor, you talked about natural disaster. I'm looking at the Natural Hazard Center. A lot of this is based on past disasters. Are these centers looking into uh, the future disasters, such as cyber disasters or whatnot? Um, there are such centers. I, I didn't name any here because I was mostly working in the disaster space. But you better believe it, yeah, but a lot of that research is not in the public domain. Where does disaster research interface with security research? Right? So if we, if so for example, I mentioned climate refugees, which is the UN's, uh, or, or is not the UN's preferred term, climate migrants is their preferred term. Um, but climate refugees are becoming an increasingly large problem. And it's picking up the notice of security analysts and of military strategists, right? So that issues that we might have seen as humanitarian issues a decade ago are increasingly merging with security kinds of issues. And I would think a, a cyber disaster would fall squarely in that kind of position. Yeah, the, actually, the National Academy of Sciences just had a committee on disasters, climate change, and security issues, po political issues in general. Yeah. We have time for perhaps one more question. Coming right up. Hi, uh, Andrew introduced me earlier. I'm Sarah from the Center for East Asian Studies. Um, I was wondering uh, what you talked about at the very beginning of the program in terms of the citizen responders who are typically first on the scene and what sort of research has been done about their res response to responding? Like, do they grow more resilient? Do they help their communities become more prepared? 
um, or does do things typically go in the opposite direction? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, I really don't know of any research that looks at people who participated in emergent groups uh, and what happens to them. We do know that some of these groups that form in disasters stay around, you know. Uh, consequences of volunteering, that, that could be something really interesting. I had an undergrad who wanted to do a uh, wants to do an honors thesis on that. We'll see if he actually goes through with it. But he's interested in youth who volunteer and what that means to them. Again, a great thing to do with kids. I just want to say quickly, there is a body of work, I can't give you any names, but on volunteer rescue groups, and that might be a line of inquiry yes. for you. Yeah, volunteer ambulance squads and stuff, and they they go on for years. And with that, uh, let us thank uh, Dr. Kathleen Tierney for her lovely yeah. presentation.